morning, everybody. My name is Jesse, and welcome to another exciting Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants broadcast. If you're joining us for the first time, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. And today is very exciting because not only are we doing a normal program, and our normal programs are pretty epic. Last week, we had a tour of a Viking ship and like a dude who fought fires from helicopters in the Yukon. So it's been a pretty fun little bit of time. But today's program, we are joined by the amazing team at the Toronto Zoo, one of our very favorite partners in the world. All 30 plus broadcasts we have done with them are all on our YouTube channel. So if you want to see this program again or any of the other sessions we've done with them, head to our YouTube channel, check out the amazing work that they do. We always love featuring them in these broadcasts. Now for today, it is May. Spring has sprung backyard bio is underway with us at exploring by the seat of your pants we'll talk more about that a little later uh, but we are going to talk about seasonal changes in canadian animals we have got over 40 classes registered from across the country and beyond and i'm so excited to dive in with some of the changes that some of our iconic species here in canada undergo so without further ado i'm going to turn it over to mary ellen thank you so much for joining us live down the canadian domain and take us away Hello, everybody. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to having you have you be joining me here today. I am in our Canadian domain here, and we're going to be meeting some incredible species here in just a second. But before we get started, I just want to take a moment to do a quick land acknowledgement. So we're going to have Jesse bring it up on the screen here for us. And so we'd like to acknowledge that the land that we are standing on is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississauga of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, and the Haudenosaunee of the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First, Nation, First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. I also acknowledge that, the Tron that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 of the Mississauga of the Credit and the Williams Treaty signed with multiple Mississauga of the Chippewa bands. Thanks so much, Jesse. So we're going to turn the camera around here to make sure that we can, be, we can see um, our true stars of the show today as we learn about their seasonal change. So let's turn our camera around and get to know our bears. So in front of us here, we have uh, Samson and Shente. Samson's the one in the back. He's our big boy back there. And Shente's decided to come up a little bit closer to us here. And they've just gotten some of their breakfast put out for them here today. Uh, so Samson in the back, he's our oldest. He is 24 years old. Shente's a little bit younger, coming in at 23 years of age for, uh, for our grizzlies. Oh, and she's going down for a little lay down to have her snacks. They're going to come wandering around all about to make sure that they get all the nice food they have down on the ground here. So we're going to learn a little bit about the kind of changes that they go through during this time of the year. And it's actually pretty exciting because this is one of the first times that I have seen them so far this year. And that's because our bears go through uh, something in the winter time. It's similar to a hibernation. And I know you, you might have been taught hibernation in school. It's kind of an overarching term. But for these guys here, um, it's actually called a toper. And essentially what that means is they do go through sort of a sleeping or dormancy period throughout the winter. And this is the first time I've actually seen them in the springtime. They have been awake for a few weeks now. Uh, I just haven't made it down to the Canadian domain as if you've been here before at the Toronto Zoo. It's a little bit of a long trek down, but an even longer trek back up the hill. Um, and so I just haven't made it down here yet to see them. But I'm very excited that they are awake because over the winter, even though these animals uh, do wake up a little bit throughout the winter season, they don't really eat that much when they wake up, uh, but they're easily disturbed. So we don't like to uh, get them really active or, or engaged with anything while they're sleeping. As when an animal goes into their type of hibernation or dormancy, uh, they're relying on reserves that they have built up over the warmer months. And if we are getting them excited and waking them up constantly, then they're using those reserves faster. So when you're actually here in the Toronto Zoo in the winter time, I'm gonna kind of back the camera up for a second. That's the public viewing side right over there for them. And we actually board it up with wood. So you're not able to see them at all. So even if they do wake up, they're unseeable in the winter time, just to make sure that they're easily able to go back to sleep, um, to make sure that they're not using up their fat reserve too quickly. Now, I mentioned that they do go through that kind of hibernation, but what are some of the other seasonal changes that they go through? Well, during their hibernation, like I mentioned, they are sleeping or they're, they're toper, sorry. Uh, they're sleeping and they've built up that fat reserve. So you might be able to tell on the ground right now that it's a little far away um, or it's a little small on camera, I should say, but they do have lots of lettuce. I see carrots, sweet potatoes, I think oranges as well out there for them. 
And that's spread out throughout their entire exhibit. Shente right now is a whole head of lettuce, just chomping away at it. I don't know if you can hear it on the camera side, but it's it's some pretty good bare ASMR. Um, and she's going in for some sweet potatoes and carrots whole. So obviously they're eating lots of lots of veggies right now. They do eat meat though. They will eat salmon, different types of fish. And clearly we can tell that Samson is a big boy in front of us here. So in the wild, if they had the opportunity, they could hunt larger animals like caribou and deer species, but that takes a lot of energy. Those animals can run pretty quickly. If you haven't seen it already, uh, Jesse and I did a video a couple months back on cheetahs and how they run and some of their adaptations on why they run so quickly. Um, and we talk about how animals run really fast and why it takes up a lot of energy. So if you haven't seen that video, I encourage you to go back and check it out as well. It talks all about that. And just imagine how fast you would have to run to catch an animal like a deer that uses up so much energy for them and that can tire them out pretty quickly. Now, as we all probably know, there's quite a few classic stories or fairy tales out there about bears and how uh, fluffy they are as well. And they're nice, big, thick coat. And so we can see that they are a grizzly bear. They have that brown fur all over their body. In the winter time, they grow in a little bit thicker fur to help keep them nice and insulated and warm while they're sleeping. Um, but here in the spring, as it's getting a little bit cool or a little bit warmer, sorry, they're starting to shed it off. And we see that with a lot of different animals and different species here in Canada as well. Now, Jesse, I've got a little video for us if you wouldn't mind popping it up because we're here with the grizzly bears today, but I wanted to showcase a few other Canadian species as well. Um, and so we're gonna pop that video up on the screen here. So these are our Arctic wolves. This is our winter wolves here last springtime. It was a very wet and rainy day in the Toronto Zoo. So you can see that this wolf here is kind of like a dull or like a more beigey brown color. He's also got quite a bit of mud on him. We go for a nice big stretch there. And in a second, we're gonna see a contrasting photo of that wolf from the middle of the winter time. And we're gonna see that that wolf is significantly brighter in color in the winter. Um, and they also have that kind of fluffier fur the whole time as well. And that acts as an insulation for them as well, keeps them nice and cozy, nice and warm. And they actually use that big fluffy tail uh, to help like a scarf in the winter as well when they're trying to um, uh, stay warm while they're sleeping. So there's that contrasting photo of our wolves looking very bright um, and fluffy in the winter time. When you're here in the winter, it can actually be a little bit hard sometimes to find them in their exhibit because uh, they do blend in pretty well. There's another one there for us. And we also see on the backs of them here that there is snow on their back. And oftentimes people think that it means they're cold. But if you see snow on an animal's back, it actually means that their coat is doing its job and it's insulating them. So here's another animal we have here at the Toronto Zoo. This is our caribou uh, herd. And we're focusing in on them because their seasonal changes are a little bit more noticeable with their fur. Uh, they get a little bit patchy at this time of year as they're losing their big thick winter coat. But one change that isn't as noticeable is about their feet. So caribou have hooves and they're pretty interesting um, design to them. So they have one of the longest migrations, which means they travel across Canada, across their home uh, from a winter to a summer kind of habitat that they go to to find different types of food. And during this journey through their walk, uh, their feet are useful for not just carrying them to and from these locations, but also finding them food. So in the uh, summertime, when it's a little bit muddy or boggy outside, humans, we might wear our rain boots outside, you know, our galoshes. We can even see a keeper there in the video had their rain boots on. Caribou don't need that. Their feet get really soft and plush. Um, and when they step in on the ground, they kind of like spread their weight out. So they're able to uh, kind of absorb it and they don't sink too far into the mud and the dirt. And then in the winter time, there's snow on the ground here in Canada. So of course they gotta go searching for their food. We can see our caribou here is eating lots of hay. Um, I think they had some grain and also some carrots and things like that out for them as well. But they have to go searching for that in the winter. And the way that they do that is they use those feet. They get a little bit harder in the winter and kind of like a sh outer shell. And they can dig through all of that ice and snow, just like how humans in the winter, we change into our winter boots as well to protect our feet so they're nice and warm. Um, and we can walk on ice and things like that as well. There we go. I think the video goes for a little bit longer, Jesse, but you can cut it there for us. Thank you. 
Perfect. We'll come back to our bears here as they're snacking away. So I mentioned all these different adaptations that they have in the spring and summertime to help them because they have to prepare for all of these different seasons. And it's quite incredible to see the animals here at the Toronto Zoo do this because in Canada, we have four very distinct seasons, you know, summer, winter, fall, and spring, but not everywhere in the world has those. And actually our next guest speaker, Julie, coming up in a moment is gonna talk a little bit about that. So our bears here and all of our other Canadian species have to prepare for those very distinct uh, seasons that we have, very, very different temperatures. It can get so hot here in the summertime and absolutely freezing in the wintertime. So how do we manage that for them here at the zoo? So we have a really incredible team here of keepers and nutrition staff and veterinarians at the Toronto Zoo who work together and observe our animals here to make sure that we're giving them the best care possible for their season. So for a lot of our animals, even though our ones who maybe aren't used to our seasons here, we try and make it as easy for them as possible in coming into different seasons, like going into springtime. But for our bears who go through it naturally as well, we have our pool that we can see on the left-hand side of the screen right over there. So that helps them cool down. If you're ever here in the summertime, Samson, our big boy in front of us, he absolutely adores to go into the pool with a ball or a stick and he'll throw it around for you. And it's like he's playing catch with it. Um, we also have air conditioning in a lot of our buildings. So for example, our polar bears get an air conditioned house to help keep them cool. Their water is kept at a cooler temperature. I don't know about you, but in the summertime, I love to have some popsicles or some ice cream. Well, our animals do too. I like to call them fishsicles though as we'll get fish frozen in blocks of ice or maybe some of their fruit as well and their vegetables. So a yummy little cold treat for them in the hot summer days or hot spring days as they're getting used to it. We also have different enrichments for them as well. So all over this exhibit, we can see, I'm gonna pull the camera back for a second. There's a log here. There's some tunnels over there. There's a few logs there. And over in the back, we have Shente's favorite ball that she likes to roll around on. Um, but also throughout their exhibit, you're going to see different items that they can scratch on. And if you're here at the zoo, you might see something that's like giant. It's red or usually blue in color. And they're kind of spiky. If you've ever been through a car wash before, that's kind of what they look like, like a car wash roller. And I think that's actually what most of them were at some point, And we've just repurposed them here. And these are to help the animals shed their fur. So one of their adaptations is that they will lose a lot of their thick winter coat at this time of the year. And if we have a big drastic change in temperature, which sometimes does happen, it's a little bit cooler today, but sometimes we get really hot really fast, they can't shed their coat fast enough to keep up. So we give them plenty of things to scratch on and move around uh, so they're able to shed their coat. And then it comes off in kind of bigger clumps on them. Like this log next to uh, Samson here, they can rub up against that. It's a nice rough log. It's very natural. And they can help them take their coat off, which is really cool. All righty. We're going to check back in with Samson in a little bit here. But we're going to pass it over to Julie and learn a little bit more about some other animals who maybe don't have to go through seasonal changes, but have some really cool adaptations that help them to thrive and survive. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Mary Ellen. I'll turn it over to Julie in just a second, but I want to note again for our audience, you guys have been so spoiled in these zoo programs with a live animal interactions. I have been to the zoo many times. I've never had the grizzly bear this close. What a special, unbelievable experience. Might be because of where you are, Mary Ellen, but I hope all our visitors get the chance to go down to the Canadian domain if you get the chance to visit in the weeks and months to come. Now, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to our friend Julie to blow our minds and meet other science, and then we will take your questions at the end on our YouTube and Facebook uh, channels all around. So Julie, thank you so much and uh, take us away. Awesome. Well, thank you for having me. I'm happy to be back. Um, I thought since Mary Ellen was going to talk today about seasonal changes, I'd talk a little bit about primates um, and their seasonal changes. Let me see if I can share my screen here. Can you see that, Jesse? I sure can. It's perfect. If you want to drag that little StreamYard sharing your screen banner to the side, that would be perfect. Beautiful. And you are good to go. <laughs> All right. Awesome. 
Um, so I thought today, first of all, we talk about uh, just define what a biome is, um, because a lot of what Mary Ellen's talking about of animals up in the north um, and having to deal with big seasonal changes, it's all about the biome that they're living in. So we can define biome. And then I can tell you about primate habitat. So I'm a professor at the University of Toronto. Oh, and now my screen is not. Oh, can you see that? Yep, you're all good. It, there has to be some tech flaw, otherwise there's no fun for <laughs> virtual broadcast, so no worries. Exactly. Um, okay, so I study primates, and just to remind you um, what primates are. So primates are the order of mammals that we belong to, um, but it also includes lemurs, lorises, tarsiers, all of the monkeys, um, and the lesser apes and the great apes. Um, so primates um, are a really diverse order, there's more than 400 species of primates and where we live tends to not be as seasonal as what Mary Ellen was talking about today. So first let's define a biome. What is a biome? Well maybe you guys know but these are areas that scientists have defined on the earth's surface of similar climactic conditions. So you know, there's some disagreement about where biomes should lay on the Earth's surface, but this gives you a rough idea of a, a big area where the vegetation is fairly similar because the climate is fairly similar. Um, and so that means, you know, certain animals can live in that area and take advantage of, of that area depending on their adaptations. So you don't need to worry so much about this because lots of people disagree about where certain biomes should be or not be. What we need to think about is the shape of the earth, right? It's a round ball, a round globe. And so closer to the poles, so the North Pole and the South Pole, we find that the weather is cooler and more seasonal. So snow builds up in the winters um, and melts in the summers and we get these big seasonal flux fluxes, just like Mary Ellen was talking about. But near the equator, right? The equator is the line that goes around the ball of the earth. Near the equator, it's warmer and it's a lot less seasonal. And so this is where primates like to live. And in fact, it's not just primates. There's something called the global biodiversity gradient. And so this is a heat map of the Earth. And what it's showing you, where it looks hotter, where it looks redder, that's where there's more biodiversity. So not just animals, but also plants. A lot more um, biodiversity. As you can see, right near the equator, near that line around the Earth, and as you move up away from the equator, it gets cooler and more seasonal and you get less plant species, less plant biodiversity and biomass and less animals that go along with it because animals typically eat plants, right? So primates are right in that belt where it looks very biodiverse. So what that means is for biomes, the productivity of the vegetation, right? So how many plants we have, how much they're fruiting and flowering and leafing out um, varies really widely in different biomes. And it's not just about how close you are to the equator. Um, it's also about how much rainfall is there um, as well as the temperature, right? So deserts do tend to be close to the equator, but there's not very much rainfall. Um, and so rainfall is also very important in determining what kind of um, plants you're going to have and what kind of biome it's going to be. So we can keep that in mind when we think about primates. So primates, as I said, are distributed across, this is non-human primates, right? Of course, we know right now we're in the North, right? So we're talking about the non-human primates that I just talked about. So they're distributed all across that equatorial belt and a little bit, some of them go a little bit North and South. Right, so here we have the equator uh, where most primates are. And then, you know, humans have also defined two different lines um, above and below the equator. So the Tropic of Cancer in the north and the Tropic of Capricorn in the south. And so areas that are in that equatorial belt below those, below the Tropic of Cancer, above the Tropic of Capricorn, uh, we call those tropical biomes. But I'm going to tell you that there's a bunch of them and areas above and below those Tropic of um, Cancer and Capricorn, those are the more temperate areas. That's where we're starting to get a little bit more seasonal and cooler. So primates tend to really love those tropical biomes that straddle the equator, but I'm gonna talk about how those differ depending on temperature and on um, how, how basically how elevated the area is or its, its altitude from sea level. 
Um, and temperate biomes above and below the equatorial belt, we don't see many primates there, but I'll talk a little bit about the ones that are there and what their adaptations are. So the, probably when you think of the tropics and you think of a tropical biome, you're probably thinking of the rainforest, right? Um, and that, that's a very good um, assumption to make about the, the most common biome um, along the um, equator. So rainforest, as we go by the name, right? Rainforests have lots of rain. Not only that, but we see that there's very little variation in day length, right? So when you think about seasonal areas like Mary Ellen was talking about, um, it's very, you know, long, dark winters with short days. And in the summer, we get a, a lengthening of the day, right? The day goes on longer. and We get those awesome summer evenings where we get to go and play and, you know, have a fire pit party and do all those things. But what we see at the equator is that the sun rises at 6 a.m., it sets at 6 p.m., and there's no variation around that if you're right on the equator. Um, so what that means is that trees, because it's warm, it's not seasonal, the days are the same, trees can keep their leaves year round, or if they lose their leaves, they just flush new ones right away. Um, so the trees are very productive. They can flower and fruit possibly at any time of the year. And you can imagine that animals love this, right? That's lots of food for them to eat. Um, and so we do see that most primate species live in the tropical rainforest right along that equatorial belt. That's where we have the highest biodiversity of primates and, and everything else as well. Um, and one reason for that is that in a tropical rainforest, there's lots of ways to make a living. So maybe you guys have heard of niches. Um, a niche is kind of the role or the lifestyle for a species in an area, a way to make a living. One animal can, can be a, a fruit eater in the mid canopy who's awake in the day, whereas another animal is an insect eater who lives in the low canopy and is awake at night. Those are two different niches, two different ways of making a living. And in the tropical rainforest, we see with you know, these tall, tall, tall trees, you know, 60 meters high with all these different variable layers of the canopy, that there's lots of different ways to make a living in there. There's lots of different food to eat, so you can have different diet. Lots of activity patterns are possible. And so that's part of the reason why we see so much biodiversity um, in tropical rainforest, right? If you think about, we're talking about big biomes, big climate um, changes, but within uh, a rainforest, just if you go up and down, you get microclimate variability that again leads to new niches, new ways for animals to make a living. Um, so microclimate varies with the layer of the forest, but also with proximity to water, right? The forest floor, if you were living down there, it would be kind of dark all the time, um, but warm and humid. Meanwhile, if you go all the way up to the top of the canopy, you're gonna find that it's very sunny and dry and hot in the day. Um, but at night, it's going to be cooler up there and windier as well. So lots of different climates, lots of different ways to make a living in the rainforest and ways to diversify your niche. And that's why we see so many animals in the rainforest. But I don't want you to think that tropical biomes are all rainforests because we have a lot of seasonal forests in the tropics as well. Um, and so in these types of forests, you can see this is the same area. You can even tell that that's the same tree. This is in the Guanacaste dry forest in Costa Rica. Um, and it's a, a seasonal dry forest where in the rainy seasons, we get lots and lots of leaves on the trees, lots of lush forest. But in the dry seasons, the leaves all fall off. Um, and so animals that live in these forests have to find a way to find food when there's not much you know, productivity in the, of the trees, not many fruits or flowers or leaves. Um, so white-faced capuchin monkeys live here um, and they're very good at diversifying their diet during these times. They might have to range and stay near um, some kind of permanent water source, but they're able to maybe eat more animal protein, find more insects during this time that they're waiting for the leaves to come back. So in these types of forests, they tend to be shorter, canopies are lower, there's fewer niches and there is less biodiversity and primates as well are not as diverse in these types of forests. But we do find that primates have evolved very well in these areas as well. So we have species from almost every primate family that lives in seasonal forests. Now, if we move away from seasonal forests to areas still in the, in the um, equatorial belt there, still a tropical biome, but we might have areas with a little less rainfall. 
Um, so these areas could be woodland, thorn, thornwood, or scrubland. So they're between those rainforests and the dry savanna, where we think of all our beautiful savanna animals from Africa. So primate densities are quite low in these areas, as you can imagine. Um, they rarely support more than one to three primate species, um, except in Madagascar. And Madagascar, as you guys probably know, that's where lemurs live, and it's um, incredibly biodiverse there. Now, if we move into another tropical biome, the savanna mosaic, this is even drier, um, but yet we do have at least three primate species that have evolved to live in this area. So we have baboons who are so tough and so smart. Um, we have paddis monkeys and we have vervet monkeys in these areas. Um, and these animals, the way they can live in the savanna mosaic is because they're willing to be on the ground, they're willing to move across the ground, um, and in fact, paddis monkeys are the fastest land monkey. They don't run on their palm like other monkeys. They run up on their tiptoes um, and that's so they can outrun predators like lions and things like that on the savanna. So though these primates are okay to cross the ground, okay to move across the ground, they always still require that there's some trees in their home range. And that's because it's very dangerous to sleep on the ground. You need to have a safe place to sleep. So there has to be at least some trees for these animals to live in a savanna mosaic. Now, still in the tropics, still along the equator, we do have deserts, right? Those areas that get very, very little rainfall. <clears throat> so are primates found in the desert? How would you make your life um, in this area, like the skeleton coast here in Namibia? Well, yes, there are primates found there. If you can believe it, there are primates in the desert, and I bet you can guess which primate it is. Which primate lives in the desert? Baboons. Um, but only because they are so smart um, and so wily and able to find a way to live in these areas. Um, but even for them, if it's too dry for too long in the desert, they do suffer. Um, and so they have to be really, really, um, really tough and what they do actually, they dig wells down for water. So they'll actually do what humans do in dry areas. They can sort of see, you know, areas where there might be a little bit more green, maybe even smell the water and dig down to try to find some water to drink. Now, if we move away from that equatorial belt, um, primates are really not very common, but we do have some in the temperate forests. So these are areas where, as you can see with these snub-nosed monkeys, they have to deal with cold and snow, um, and it's quite difficult to make a living in the winter. So only a few primate species occupy these seasonal areas um, because the trees are deciduous, right? The leaves fall off, but they don't come back right away. They're, they're going to be gone all winter. Um, and then if you move up to higher elevations, there's only going to be needle bearing trees like evergreens. Um, so that's really difficult as a primate to try to find what you need to eat. Um, so the animals that have adapted to these habitats are often eating um, quite different things like lichens um, in order to try to survive through the winter. So what are some other primate adaptations that we see to the cold? As I said, we primates don't like cold. We don't live in the cold very often, um, but we show a lot of the adaptations like Mary Ellen was talking about when primates are in the cold. So primates in colder areas have larger body size and you might think that makes no sense. Why would you want a large body size in the cold? Then you have to find more food to eat, right? And food is hard to find. However, what happens when you have a large body size is that you can eat low quality food. You can eat kind of a lot of, a lot of low quality food, but this allows you to maintain a low surface area to volume ratio. I don't know if you guys have heard that, but you have less surface area outside of, of that's exposed to the cold and the, and the winter um, and a greater volume inside for a big, bigger body in order to stay warm for longer. So it's actually hard to be a small animal in the cold. Um, so large body size is what we see for primates, as well as they, you know, they have these thick insulating coats like a, like a parka that you put on in winter. Um, they have to have all the time to live in these areas. And when it's very, very cold and at night, they huddle together to try to, to get body warmth. Um, and then when, it, when the sun comes out, they lay out in the sun to try to soak up the rays and, and try to warm their bodies up. But in the winter still, they need to, they need to really conserve energy. Um, just like the bears, they don't hibernate or go into torpor, these particular species, but they move less. They hang out in one particular area 
where you know the most reliable food is and then they'll spend more time feeding um, and hopefully try to find some high fat food sources like like nuts or something um, to help them survive through those cold periods so if we go past the temperate forests right further north or further south there's no non-human primates that live there but who does live there us right so humans we live further north and south than any other primate and I bet you can guess how we do that. I bet you know exactly how we do that. Culture, right? <laughs> um, we do that with our tools and our shelters, um, our ways of, you know, padding our bodies with all sorts of, of warm, um, you know, toques, mitts, coats, boots, everything, snowshoes, all these things. Um, and very, very importantly for how we started to move north and south as, as primates, is fire, right? We controlled fire and so we were able to make ourselves a nice warm spot um, to rest, even though it's very, very cold and hard to find food and hard to make a living. Um, so that's all I have to say today. I'm very happy to, to answer your questions though. Fantastic. Julie, thank you so much for diving in with us. I love the feedback on our Facebook channel for our Toronto Zoo today. Way to go, guys. we got groups all over the UK, Canada, the US watching in, which is awesome. Um, I'm going to bring back uh, Mary Ellen, too, at the zoo, and we are going to dive in with questions. So we've got a bunch of live classes with us. If you have questions for either Mary Ellen and the zoo team or Julie about that fantastic follow-up with the science, uh, we'd love to dive in. If you're on YouTube or Facebook, share your queries there. And what we'll do, too, is I know we're going to get more questions that we can answer in one single broadcast. So I'm making up a Padlet, a virtual whiteboard. You will be able to share some additional questions over the next couple of days with both our guest speakers today. So without further ado, let's start with West Glen Junior School right up the road from Etobicoke. You guys want to kick us off with a question? You are good to go. Hey, guys. Hi there. Um, so I have a couple of questions from students. Um, so um, Agreem, who's in grade three, is asking, how are primates related to humans? Ooh, Julie, all right. That's for you for sure. <laughs> Oh, that's a really good one. Well, primates are like our cousins. So we are primates. We're classified with primates. But of course, all the primates that are alive today, uh, we did not evolve from them, right? Because if you go back millions of years, they weren't here either, right? But we share a common ancestor with them. So that means that they are like our cousins. Um, they're not our ancestors. So you could think about um, more closely related primates like chimpanzees. We share a common ancestor with them sooner in time than we do with monkeys or with um, with tarsiers or, or lemurs or something like that. So the apes, the great apes are our closest cousins, but all the primates are um, kind of distant cousins. Yeah. Another way, I mean, I think people get sort of tripped up sometimes in a human and other great ape context. A tiger didn't evolve from a lion. These are two separate species that are different, but they evolved from a common ancestor together that would have split off at some point in the past. One group of which ended up being tigers, one group of which ended up being lions. The same deal applies with us and chimpanzees and gorillas, orangutans, and so on. So I love that question as a kickoff to, to the Q&A. Good shepherd, uh, Miss Benoit's class, come on in and take us away. Hey, guys. How much does Samson weigh? Ooh, Samson, Mary Ellen, that's for you. Great question. And I actually happen to have one of Samson's keepers here with me. So Samson usually weighs about 1,200 pounds when he goes down for hibernation. When he wakes up, he's usually about 1,100. So he doesn't actually lose as much as you think. And then he continues to lose for another two months before they actually start gaining weight after their torpor. Wow. He's a, that's a, that is a big, a hardy bear, needless to say. Again, what a cool opportunity to have them so close to the camera. Great question, guys. All right, let's head to Miss Wilson's class. Come on in and uh, take us away. Hey. Uh, why are lemurs only on Madagascar? Ooh, all right, Julie, this is for you. Come on in. Oh, that's a very good question. So we think that lemur ancestors probably lived on um, in Africa, so in mainland Africa, um, and then some of them made their way over to Madagascar because Madagascar was already separate and off on its own trajectory um, in the ocean. So we think that they did that by rafting. They were maybe on a clump of, you know, vegetation on mainland Africa that broke off and went across um, to Madagascar. And back in the, back in when we think this happened, the, the, um, the tides were quite favorable to make that possible. And in addition, um, similar to what Mary Ellen's been talking about with bears, some lemurs can go into torpor. So we think even if they were on this chunk of vegetation that didn't have enough 
uh, food, they could have maybe just gone into torpor for a while, made their way over to Madagascar, and their, their relatives died out on mainland Africa, but they flourished in Madagascar. So they found a, a really unique place with many different open niches, like I talked about, and they, they evolved into all these different niches. Um, so we have lemurs that do everything, right? We have, we've got leaf eating lemurs, insect eating lemurs, uh, fruit eating lemurs. We've got, you know, lemurs of all different sizes with different social systems. And that's because they, they really diversified their niches on Madagascar and evolved to be as cool as they are today. I absolutely love this question. And it's one of those things that we know is a fact in science, but sounds so outlandish. Oh, there's animals they're rafting over. And yeah, sure, they cross a thousand kilometers of ocean. We've observed things doing this. We've seen like iguanas and bigger things than lemurs crossing across on rafts in the ocean. Uh, it's wild to think about, but very, very cool. And I would encourage our classes too, if you want to see uh, uh, sort of a rendering of the largest lemur ever. There used to be a lemur in Madagascar about gorilla size. So Megalodapus, a fantastic creature. I encourage you guys to check that out when you're done as well. All right, let's head to our next class. Miss Hopkins, 4B, if you guys want to come on in, uh, just unmute your mic, turn on your camera. I can come to you guys in just a second, actually, while you're doing that. We'll head to Miss Fisher's group first. So just unmute your microphone, guys, and come on in. Hey, Miss Fisher's group, welcome in. Hi. Hello, hello, yes. I know you are on camera, it's the best. But unmute your mic, we wanna take a question from you guys. Okay, Justin, go ahead. How do, how do monkeys keep their tail on, on like tree branches and hey. without falling? Yeah, Julie, what's going on? How are those monkeys so adept? Well, that's a very good question. And you know what, the, the tail, they think, actually helps monkeys in the trees because it gives them an extra kind of point of balance. So often when they're sitting in the trees, you know, they're on a little skinny branch, they're trying to use their hands um, to reach some food, so they can't really use their hands to hold on. Often their tail is hanging down and it's doing this kind of circular motion. It's kind of helping that monkey balance while it's reaching up into the canopy. Um, so tails are actually really helpful in the trees. Um, and very helpful if they're prehensile. Do you guys remember prehensile tails? Like a spider monkey, they can actually hang from their tail, right? So they have a fifth arm, they can hold on in the canopy, which is very, very cool. So yeah, if we if we decide to move back into trees, we should maybe consider, you know, putting on some tails somehow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. pin the tail on the human. Uh, by the way, I did like the illustration with the body. That was very helpful to my understanding. <laughs> Uh, let's head to Miss Hopkins' class. Come on in. We'll take a couple from YouTube, and then I'll make sure that you guys all have that Padlet link to share more questions. Again, time flies, and you're having fun with this cool science stuff, everybody. Uh, but Miss Hopkins, come on in. Take us away. Hey, guys. How many different animals are in the Toronto Zoo? Ooh, Mary Ellen, you're up for this one. Come Wonderful on. question. We love to talk about that. So overall, there's about 4,000 animals here at the Toronto Zoo, but there's about 350 to 400 different species. So think about it here. These are our grizzly bears in front of them, but they're two individual animals. So there's about 4,000 overall. And what's really cool right now, it's a little hard to see, but Samson here is in his pool. He's actually getting peanuts off the top and there's Shente right there as well. It's really my lifelong goal, and it might happen over the summer, to just be in a pool where I get peanuts given to me. That sounds just amazing. <laughs> He's loving um, the life. I do, by the way, for our classes that are keen on more zoo species, if you go back through our YouTube channel, we've done giraffes, we've done polar bears, I think we've done every pavilion in the zoo, and of course, if you guys want to visit in person, uh, torontozoo.com, tickets there, information there about the amazing conservation work they do, and so, so much more, it's such a remarkable institution, and I hope our classes get the chance to go in person in the not-too-distant future. Now, we are at the 40-minute mark, which means I know some of our classes have to go, and so, if you have more questions about seasonal changes at the zoo, or a lot of the great primate stuff that Julie was sharing from UTSC. Our Padlet is on the screen below. Now I have put this in all our YouTube and Facebook chats as well, uh, but if you want to go to that link, share your questions there. We'll leave that up for two days if you want to get those extra queries in. It's a lot of fun and a neat way to keep the learning going. Before we wrap up though, I'm going to take two quick questions from our groups online. Uh, Miss Avakian's class wants to know, what do you do with the leftover fur that is shed? So in the zoo, you got this fur that's coming off the animals. Mary Ellen, what, do they put it on anything? Do you have like a cool coat that you can show us? Or what's going on? <laughs> Good question. Well, I know from, so I work in the education department here at the Toronto Zoo or the learning and engagement department. And for us, we do try and keep a small collection of all the fur that we can collect from animals. 
to use for educational reasons. Actually, speaking of videos we've done in the past, we did a video, I believe, in the end of last year, early this year, about biofacts, and we looked at some of the furs of different animals. Um, I'm going to ask our keeper here, Courtney, to see if she knows any other ways that they use it. Uh, yeah, so we, at least for our Canadian section, we've gone through our veterinary team and gotten certain hairs approved for what animals they can go to. And we will use it for enrichment for other animals. So in the wild, um, depending on territories, there is a chance that grizzlies might come across bison or caribou. And so giving them their hair is very natural. So again, all those animals shed as well. So we pick it all up. We'll save it all. We'll give it to different animals for sensory enrichment. So our bison hair, we have 18 female bison. So we do get a lot of bison hair. Yeah. So pretty much all of our carnivores have had bison hair and they usually quite love it. They'll roll in it. They'll toss it in the air. It's very good sensory enrichment. And to give you an idea here, right on the ground in front of us, I yeah. see four large clumps of grizzly wow. hair right bison. in front of, or yeah, oh, that's that bison that hair there for them. Oh. Yeah for their enrichment. No way. Not only yeah. was that an amazing explanation that I never would have thought, we want more footage of that. And the fact that there's actually some in the enclosure right now is incredible. So thank you very much for that question, Ms. Evakian's class. That's incredible. Um, one last question before we wrap up. Uh, this one's for you, Julie. So what's the difference between a mammal and a primate from one of our friends on our Facebook channel? Oh, that's a great question. So a mammal is just a a higher order of um, of classifying animals and primates are mammals, right? So all it means to be a mammal is that you're warm blooded. So you maintain a constant body temperature all the time. So you do all these things that we need to do like shiver to keep warm and you know try to sweat to, to get cool. Um, so mammals have warm body temperature and we have live young that we then feed from our bodies, right? So we feed from our mammary glands. So that's what it means to be a mammal and primates are mammals, but there's many other mammals, right? So bears, of course, um, caribou, everything that we talked about today actually was a mammal. So maybe we need to expand and talk about um, non-mammals <laughs> next, next time. Next time on Toronto Zoo, Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants, UTSC Triple Feature. Um, <laughs> guys, this has been so, so much fun. Julie, Mary Ellen, I'm going to bring you in and our fantastic zookeepers as well. Uh, thank you all so much for joining today. Again, I want to note if people have more questions, you can check out the pad that below. It is linked to all of you, and I'll make sure our groups on uh, our registered classes get it as well. And head to torontozoo.com to learn more about the amazing work they are doing. Now, Julie, Mary Ellen, you guys are very familiar with us at this point, but we are going to bring in all our classes to say a big thank you and farewell the so west glenn jr good shepherd uh miss fisher miss wilson thank you so much for being thank here. you oh,